All right, well, I would like to share a thought with you this evening. And I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. I'd like to speak from that portion, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And I'd like to speak under the subject of unfailing faith. Unfailing faith. One of the best ways to examine a topic is in the life of a person. When you study, look at a topic of faith, in the life of a person, you get to see the practical applications of the concept that you're looking at. Faith is one of my particular favorite topics. I love preaching about it. And I like to examine it in the life of the Apostle Peter. Now, the scriptures have much to say about Peter. He was a fascinating character. And Peter was one of the first characters that I became acquainted with as a little boy, as I'm sure many of you have, as he was the apostle that denied Jesus Christ three times. One of the first lessons we learned as a Sunday school student one of those things that sticks in your memory. Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times. That was his rep. <laughs> Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport. The thrill of victory. And the agony of defeat. And that used to come on all the time. I don't know if it was on Saturday or Sunday. Every week you would see it. The guy known as the agony of defeat. And I thought about this guy because he probably made a thousand great jumps in his life. And the one screw up. The one wipeout gets played over and over and over every week. Imagine your worst day in your life, and it gets talked about over and over and over again. And that's what I think about with Peter. His biggest mess up is repeated story after story, hundreds of years, just over and over again. But there was so much more to this man, as there is so much more to you than your biggest screw-up. When God comes into your life, he can take your worst day and turn it into victory. The Apostle Peter, let's start with his name. He actually had three names. Now, there were times uh, all through the scriptures, historically, God would change people's names, Abram to Abraham, 
Sariah to Sarah, Jacob to Israel. But Jesus didn't exactly change his name. He actually gave him an additional name. It says, and he brought Jesus and looked at him and said, you are Simon, which is a Hebrew name, son of John. You shall be called Kaipha, which is not Cephas, by the way. It's Kaipha. Simon is called Kaipha, which is translated Peter. Again, it says, on the day he called his disciples, he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles, and Simon, whom he also named Peter. So he gave him an additional name. The name Peter was a name given to him by Jesus Christ. So it wasn't a substitute, and oftentimes you see both names used, Simon, Peter. The name Peter comes from the Greek Petros, and we get our word petroleum, petrified. It means rock. If it were today, you may have called him Rocky. I don't know. But his name meant rock. But was Peter a rock? It may have been an odd name to give him, given some of the experiences and some of the things that occurred in his life. I want to list some of those things. Peter is mentioned and named more than any other disciple. So he clearly had a very special place in the life of Jesus. Mentioned more than any other disciple, even Lazarus. You'd have to read my book to know what I'm talking about there. He spoke to Jesus more than anybody recorded. He was spoken to by Jesus more than anyone else. Peter asked Jesus more questions than anybody else. Peter was asked more questions by Jesus than anyone else. Peter was the only person recorded to have ever rebuked, rebuked Jesus Christ. Fascinating that this was a man that actually rebuked our Lord and Savior. We read that, ironically, on his champion day. On his great confession, it says, from that time, after he confesses, you're the Christ, Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up the third day. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen. And to no surprise, was rebuked by Jesus more than anybody else. We also know a little bit about his family life. Blessed are you, Simon Jonah. He was the son of a man named John. We also know he had a brother. Andrew, the first apostle called, was the brother of Simon Peter. And one of the two that heard John the Baptist speak followed him, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said, we have found the Messiah. We also know that Andrew actually lived with Peter. And they came in from, from the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. We also know that he was a married man. Paul talking, do we not have the right to take on a believing, take along a believing wife, it's the rest of the apostles and the brother of our Lord and Kaipha? We also know that when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in the bed with fever. He actually lived with his mother-in-law. So Peter owned the home, 
And it had to have been a sizable home. And he lived with his brother Andrew. And he had a wife. And his mother-in-law lived with him. So he had at least two women in his home. His wife and his mother-in-law. Don't read into any more of that than you should. I'm just giving you the facts. We know something about his business. He was a relatively successful businessman. We know that he owned at least two boats. As it says that they entered one of the boats, which was Simon's. We know that also that John and James, the son of Zebedee, were partners in Peter's business. So he was a relatively successful businessman. And you can see that now, so he had a big home, large family, big enough to house several people, owned the business, possibly was the employer of his fishing business. And so Peter had it pretty much going on. There's no doubt that this is what Peter had in mind when he at one occasion said to the Lord, see, we have left all to follow you. He said, I gave up a lot to be here. Jesus responded and said, surely I say to you that no one has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom who shall not receive many times more in this present life and in the age to come eternal life now some of us have taken this verse to mean that god's going to promise us a lot of stuff we follow and that's not what jesus was saying what jesus was saying and trying to convey to peter peter don't ever think that you're doing me a favor by following me. And likewise, we should never think that we give up so much to serve the Lord. Anything that you do for Jesus Christ is your reasonable service. You hear people talk, and I have been serving the Lord for 25 years. I've been serving the Lord for 35 years. The Lord has kept you for 25 years. The Lord has kept you for 35 years. We should never get to the place where we think we're doing so much for Jesus. Jesus did everything for you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at Peter in the context of the other apostles, the 12. We have in the scriptures when it lists the names of the 12 apostles, we, we see an interesting pattern develop. Because they always seem to be listed in this order. That is to say, there seems to be three clusters of four. Simon Peter is always mentioned first. Judas Iscariot is always mentioned last. Now, there were two Simons. There were two James and two Judases. That's half the crew right there. Philip is always mentioned fifth. And James is always mentioned ninth. So there seems to be a direct pattern, four by four by four, three clusters of four, in which these names appear consistently. Now, in that first cluster where Peter is, we have Peter, James, Andrew, and John. And what's interesting to see here is that we actually have in the first four a set of two brothers. Peter and Andrew are brothers. James and John are brothers. We also know that they all work together, which means they knew each other long before they ever met Jesus Christ. 
they may very well have grown up together as children. And so these four have a history. And it's, it's very interesting because there was one conversation where it says James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do something for us, whatever we ask of you. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And look at this. He says, grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in glory. I would love to have been a fly on the wall and watching Peter's face as he sat there and heard James and John asking for this. What were they saying? We've been under this guy for a long time. Why don't you make us over him now? So these are the things that the information that we have about this man. Now, Peter was oftentimes at least the unofficial spokesman for the apostles. For instance, we see when Jesus said, who touched me? The woman with the issue of blood. He asked the question, not to any specific one. And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, we're all in the crowd. Everyone's touching you. What are you talking about? So he tend to be the one to jump out and speak for the crowd. Now keep this in mind as Peter's going down that ski slope that he's become known for. Peter said to him, even though they may fall away, yet I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. But look at the next verse. And they were all saying the same thing also. So while Peter picks up the bad rap for doing it, every one of them were thinking the same thing. Peter was, alas, a man of contradiction. We read in the story in Acts, it says about noon, he, Peter, was hungry. While a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky open. And something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And in the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, birds. Then the voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Peter says, no, Lord. No, Lord. A contradiction in terms. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish law is not de has declared impure and unclean. You wonder if he recalled the time when Jesus challenged, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Peter was a man of contradiction. Peter was also an all or nothing kind of guy. He would go from one extreme to the other extreme. Peter said, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered and said, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. He goes from never to Lord, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. So Peter was an all or nothing guy. A man of contradiction, but an all or nothing guy. Now, let's bring it more to our topic. The scripture says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest is love. This tripod of faith, hope, and love that is familiar to all of us in this famous chapter here 
It is not the only time that these three words appear together. They actually appear several times together. For instance, in Ephesians, for this reason, I too, having heard of your faith, of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, is, exists among you, and your love for all the saints do not cease giving thanks for you or making mention you in my prayers. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. There you see the faith, hope, and love. You see it also again in Colossians. We give thanks to God the Father Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you. We see it again in Thessalonians. Constantly bearing in mind the work of your faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. See it again in Thessalonians. Since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So these three virtues appear quite often together. Faith, hope, and love are what define you as a Christian. Faith, hope, and love defines your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your doctrine doesn't define your relationship with God. Doctrine is important, but your doctrine doesn't define who you are. It may define your denomination, but it's your faith, your hope, and your love that speaks to who you are in God. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, with faith, hope, and love, hope and faith actually have an interesting partnership together. What makes the Christian hope? When Thessalonians talks about not grieving like people who have no hope, well, what are people that have no hope? Are they just unbelievers? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What does that mean? Faith gives hope substance. If you don't have faith, you have hope that will have no substance. For instance, you think about when you have a dream. And I can have some fantastic dreams. I mean, I'm a superhero. I'm flying through the air. I'm saving the world. Some of you were in my dreams. And what happens when you have a dream? You wake up and poof, it's gone. Why? Because the dream has no substance to it. Faith gives hope substance. Faith takes hope and turns it into something that is solid. Now, when Jesus spoke to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. In other words, Satan wants to kill you. He says here, but I have prayed for you. And what does Jesus pray for? He prays that his faith wouldn't fail him. Now, you think about this. How would we pray for someone in this condition? We would think, and I know some of us, we, we lay hands on Peter. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. I cast you out. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't stop Satan. He doesn't say, Satan's after you. He wants to kill you, but I'm going to make sure he doesn't touch you. 
I'm going to intercede for you and keep him off of you. No. He says, I pray that your faith doesn't fail. Now, the Bible says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What is it that Satan, the thief, comes to steal? The thief is not after your stuff. Satan is not trying to get your house. He's not trying to take your job. He wants to steal your faith, hope, and your love. And he'll use your stuff in order to knock you out of the race. He'll afflict you and try to rob you of your things to see if it will shake your faith, to see if it will hinder your hope, to see if it will affect your love. Satan doesn't mind if you have a lot of money. If you go and you don't have love for anybody else, he's fine with that. Satan doesn't care that you drive a nice car. If he can get you to be a hypocrite in the church and have no faith and no hope and no love, then he has robbed you. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. The only kind of fight you ought to be in is in a faith fight. I'm here to tell you that your pastor is not your problem. Your church is not your problem. The people in your church are not your problem. The folks on your job are not your problem. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. People, demons that will try to rob you of your faith. He says, Peter, Satan is trying to kill you, but you're going to need strong faith in order to survive him. You're going to need strong faith in order to conquer him. Peter would rise to the occasion as we see his testimony as he grows in the Lord and says we would much rather obey God than man. We know that as the story goes, as history tells us, when it came time to give up his life, said, don't even crucify me like my Lord Jesus. I'm not even worthy to be crucified like him. Turn me upside down. He rose to the occasion, and he wouldn't let Satan rob him of his faith. Wouldn't let Satan rob him of his hope and his love. There is a story where a man came to Jesus with a son who was afflicted. And he asked Jesus, if you can, would you heal me? And Jesus said, if I can, all things are possible to him who believes. He cried out a plea that ought to be the plea in the prayer of every person of God. Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief because there is something inside me that would stop me from believing, you, believing in the Lord. There is something inside me that would try to hinder my faith. But it's going to take an unfailing faith in order to step on serpents and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. There are going to be times when trials come your way. There will be times when hardships will come your way. There are going to be times when it's going to seem like God is too far out of your reach. There are going to be times when it seems like he's not hearing you or he's not caring for you. But he says that I'm praying that your faith would not fail. If you can hold on to God's unchanging hand, 
and you have unfailing faith, you can look at circumstances when they go against you and still say, for God I live and for God I'll die if you hold on to your unfailing faith. Hallelujah. There was a time when Martha came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you had been here just four days earlier, hallelujah, my brother would not have died. He said, if you had just been here a little sooner, where were you, Jesus? I was calling on you, but you didn't show up. I was looking for you, but you weren't around. Hallelujah. And Jesus said to Martha, amen, if you believe, even though you're dead, I can still work a miracle. When you have unfailing faith, Jesus can be four days late and still on time. Even if you've been calling out and nothing's been happening, you've been on your face saying, I've been crying out for God, and he doesn't seem to hear me. I'm still wrapped up in my pornography. I'm still wrapped up in my addictions. My marriage is still failing me, and it seems like God isn't hearing me. But when you have unfailing faith, you can say, even if he doesn't come, when you want him, he will always be just on time. When you have unfailing faith, <laughs> hallelujah, when you have unfailing faith, he called out to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. I can see Lazarus in the grave. He had already been rotten. He had already started to decay, and I could see him starting to move inside the tombstone, wondering why he is all bound up, and even though sickness had already started to decay his body even though he started to rot away he had to get up because the resurrection and the life was calling my name and he got up out of the grave and even though he was all wrapped up and he was all bound up he still made his way out saints of God even though it looks like that God is not hearing you when you have unfailing faith you can still reach out for God and say now unto him who is able to keep me from falling and present me faultless. I want to hold on to God's unchanging hand. I want to hold on and give me strength. Lord, increase my faith. Help my unbelief. I better stop now. Let every heart pray. Every head bow.